We have actually another very special guest today with us, James Baylog. Did I say your last name right? You did. Excellent. My last name is impossible. Posazidis? Ah. Nobody gets it. That's why they just call me John P. So, But thanks for coming by. We Thank know you. you are a busy man here at the show today. Oh, boy, it's been a circus, but it's been a great circus. Yeah, the, 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 the film Chasing Ice, which is a documentary about what I've been doing the past six years, has... Uh, has just been released. It's about to start its theatrical run in New York next week. Really? So uh, there's crazy. a lot of promotion and craziness going on around it. It's pretty exciting. And I've got meetings just, you know, wall to wall, day after day after day. And you're speaking when? I'm speaking on Saturday. I think that whole block of events starts at noontime, where I'm, I'm, I'm giving a 45 minute presentation. We're doing a screening of the film. And then I'm doing a Q&A and a book signing. So it'll be, I, I think it's supposed to be roughly noontime to about 3 o'clock on Saturday. Wow. That's, that's cool. Oh, so we've got the Chasing Ice up on the screen over there. Nice. Okay, I have to ask you a question. This is a film. Yes. But you're a photographer. Yes. How does that work? I mean, you, you started in photography and you kind of turned into a videographer. No. What, 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 tell us the back story on this. Yeah. Well, I've been a photographer, a still photographer, for over 30 years, doing traditional environmental reportage, you know, Life Magazine, National Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine. I was a magazine nature photojournalist, essentially, most of my career. And in uh, 2006, I got the idea for this project uh, to, well, I got an assignment, actually, from National Geographic to photograph retreating glaciers. By the end of that assignment in 06, I thought that I should put out time-lapse cameras and go back to these glaciers wow. year after year after year and see how the ice, how the landscape was evolving. And I really didn't know what we were going to get. It all now seems kind of obvious uh, and straightforward, but it was not well, obvious. Well, only because now you have the data. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now that we did the proof of concept, it all seems obvious. But uh, in any event, uh, five and a half years ago, we put out 25 time-lapse cameras in different parts of the world, Greenland, Iceland, Alaska, Montana, uh, and, the, and, and started to watch how the world was changing. And so I became, I went from being a classical still photographer, a single frame guy, to now I'm making hundreds of thousands of images in these time-lapse cameras because they're sitting there bolted to bedrock alongside the glaciers and they're shooting every hour or every half hour around the clock. So that archive has turned into over a million pictures at wow, this point wow. at all these different sites um, because in some cases we, we, we were shooting every minute yeah. because of certain processes that were happening, happening. In any event, it's a lot of images and we're trying to tell the story of a landscape in flux. So, to get to the film, um, I am a cinematographer in the sense that my stills turned into a moving picture of time unfolding in the form of those time lapses. Um, but other people were really the videographers. Yes, I held the video camera once in a while, but mostly it was other folks who were who were classically from the video tradition who were shooting it, and those are the guys who made the film. Uh, that's, I can't wait. To, I want to see that. I mean, that. The time lapse itself sounds extremely interesting. It and sounds what, what kind of gear challenging, is doesn't it? It's, um, it's a Nikon D200 inside a, a pelican box that we cut a, a, a window into and, and put plexiglass in front of the window to keep it weatherproof. And then there's a solar panel oh. that feeds power through a big battery and a voltage regulator and a bunch of other fancy electronics. And then there's a custom computer timer that tells the camera when to fire. Any wildlife uh, walk up and say hello? We actually have had some wildlife uh, tinkering with the equipment. Um, we did have a polar bear. That, that was the one I saw. Yeah. The polar bear pushed it up the mountain and then dr let it slide down again? Oh, no, that's a different thing. That's uh, a different one. But, no, we had, a, we had a camera on the north coast of Alaska where a polar bear came right up out of the ocean and was walking along the, uh, this bluff alongside the sea, and you can see him in the background having a look at the camera. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a beauty. But uh, we had... Our biggest problem here, let's see if you can... Is that, is that giving you a little bit of trouble? Here. These little countryman type uh, microphones are kind of strange sometimes. That's, okay, that's oh, we've got a picture of you 
hanging are you hanging off the side of a uh, glacier or something what are you doing oh, there it is okay carabining down with a camera there uh, yeah well a lot of the action in the film takes place in either Greenland or Alaska and it's these really wild locations in you know, like serious serious wilderness some of these places in Greenland there's probably never been anybody uh, on the ground there before wow you know so it's it's that pristine and in that case we've rappelled down into a a big kind of a crevasse called the Mulan, a big canyon that the meltwater channels through the ice and then this water drops down to the bottom of the ice sheet and runs out to the ocean and there I'm probably somewhat foolishly risking my life to get this picture. Well okay some people think, some people look at photos like some of the ones you've taken and thought oh my god I would love to be able to go there yeah. and take that picture but the reality is it takes a ridiculous amount of planning just to even physically get there, right? Well, it takes planning, it takes uh, economic resources, which I had to spend a huge amount of my time trying to assemble, you know, from various sponsors and funding agencies. It, it also takes a lot of technical mountaineering skills. You can't just be a passionate photographer with a camera bag. You have to have a, a real range of serious technical climbing skills in order to function in these places. How and long you have you been to be, climbing? I've been climbing for 42 years. Wow. So, and I've, I've climbed in the Himalaya, the Andes, Alaska, the Alps, all over the western U.S. Uh, you know, I'm comfortable in that environment. In fact, that environment seems more natural to me than this environment here in this building does by quite a bit. This seems like alien habitat here. <laughs> I mean. Is it fair to say then that you have two passions that you've found a way to combine with your you know, climbing and mountaineering and then your photography, is that, I mean, is that the whole basis of who you are? Yeah, actually, um, that's a really good distillation. This project is the, is the coalescing of really all the main currents in my adult life, uh, the mountaineering, the photography, and there's another current, which is the science. You know, I was trained in these sciences back in the 70s when I was in undergraduate and then in graduate school. I did a master's degree in this stuff. And um, all of those interests have funneled together and made this project what it is. That's great. Have you, have you, so you've been climbing that long. Have you had any scares? I mean, have you dropped a camera? Has anything ever gone just? Oh, lots of things have gone wrong. Even on this project on the Extreme Ice Survey, we had, we had some very exciting moments uh, on the Greenland ice sheet with, with bizarre things happening with the ice. You know, you're always looking over your shoulder, wondering if something bad is about to happen. Not, not literally, yeah. because there's nothing out there. There's just you and the winds and the sun. Um, but, but the ice sheet, the ice sheet, cracks in strange ways that normal mountain glaciers don't. And, and weird things happen just the way they happen with this microphone. You see? <laughs> yeah, it keeps popping off. Uh, we'll get that. We'll have to get a different uh, microphone here. So um, it, we uh, probably the scariest thing on the whole project was we had a helicopter that started to fail when we were way out over the ocean, looking down at a at an ocean full of icebergs with you know you're you're 50 60 miles away from wow. any help, uh, and there's literally nothing down there except uh, except fish and seals, and if the helicopter goes down in that water, you're finished. He's good. Yeah, that is not good at all. Yeah. Uh, so there's that, and, 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 and weird things happen. And, you know, when you're in those kind of extreme places where the weather's squirrely, um, you're dealing with ropes, you're dealing with a lot of vertical distance, you're dealing with weird ice, you don't know what's going to come at you sometimes. So you try and be smart, you try and build a good defense, but the defense can always get penetrated. Risk. What you're doing is slightly risky to start with. Oh, because absolutely. You can only remove so much of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I guess we're going to switch a microphone out here, but uh, where? Do where you want, you want to the start book? this again? I mean, have we lost too many of the no, good no, signals? No, 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 it's been okay. going. Oh, they're, oh, okay. they're augmenting with a handheld. There you go. Good. See, we just move things around on the fly. Excellent. Um, uh, yeah, I think you were asking. Now, is it where can people find the book? Where are they going to be able to the, see the, it? Yes, the thank you. Movie. Uh, yeah, the, bo the book was published by Rizzoli. It's called Ice Portraits of Vanishing Glaciers. I'll be signing some copies after uh, the presentation on Saturday. Uh, the, uh, the, the book is uh, in the bookstores, assuming that the bookstores actually ordered it. Uh, you know, nice. I can't control that. Uh, the film is called Chasing Ice. 
It uh, premieres theatrically in New York on November 9th and releases nationwide on November 16th. And uh, it will be on National Geographic TV next spring and Netflix after that oh, and DVD release. And, oh, your, cool. and your website? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, lest I forget, yes, we have a website, uh, earthvisiontrust.org and extremeicesurvey.org. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about here is that, uh, and I've wanted to do this for 20 years, we founded a new uh, philanthropic organization, a 501c3, called Earth Vision Trust, which is meant to be a visual voice for our changing planet. Okay, We're in a period of historic, monumental natural change right now at, at a greatly accelerated rate compared to what natural processes do and it's been accelerated by human impact so there's a basically limitless number of stories out there in the world that we can be telling through pictures and video and words to communicate this historic change to the general public so earth vision trust is devoted to telling those stories and the extreme ice survey that we're talking about this glacial project is just one of many projects that we are doing and want to keep doing as the years go on can anybody uh, purchase any prints absolutely there's uh, fine art prints yes definitely and uh, those go towards helping fund the organization yeah absolutely they're they're a key part of the funding stream to keep this this creature alive i mean it's a really expensive uh, operation uh, yeah. we've got incredible field costs to give you some idea the cheapest helicopters in greenland are five thousand dollars an hour wow an hour yeah an hour so you know you could you could spend weeks walking to our sites but that's not a very good use of human time in limited summertime you know equity you yeah. know you're better off getting a helicopter if you can afford it and going out to to do your work so uh, yeah we we burn up some a painful amount of money sometimes yes wow. i bet you get some really really nice results it's been amazing really you know i've been i've been shooting these kinds of landscapes for you know 40 years easily and more than once when I've been packing to go on these field expeditions, I've, I've kind of groaned in, inwardly and said to myself, oh my God, do I have to go and do this again? What can I possibly shoot on this trip that I haven't seen before? And every single trip, something new and amazing happens. It's this continuing process, continual process of discovery, you know, just seeing new things as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the reality of what the world is. It's a really a magical mystery tour in its own way. There you go, magical the, mystery tour. There's a lot of people who are watching who are amateurs, okay? And they'd like to do more. And I think if they're anything like me, sometimes they, they find themselves in this same position where they think, well, I'd like to go out and practice my photography, but I can't go to an iceberg. I can't go do crazy things. I, I, there's nothing for me to photograph. I mean, how do you get over that? Well, you know, I think it's it's important uh, to recognize that you don't always have to be questing out over some distant horizon to do something beautiful and amazing. And because of the nature of my profession and doing a lot of work uh, off and on for the years, uh, over the years for National Geographic, you get locked into this mentality of we have to go to some faraway place to do good work. That really isn't true. Um, I remember reading something uh, where, where over a hundred years ago somebody was asking Paul Cezanne why he always painted that one mountain that he saw from his backyard and why he always painted that one bowl of fruit. Yeah. And he, his answer was there's basically a limitless universe of possibilities in the smallest objects and they are in your backyard. It's a question of your perception and your seeing. So the point for all photographers is you don't have to go wandering over the far horizon. Yes, that is what I do. Yes, it's glamorous and exciting and adventurous, but that isn't necessary. There, there are great things close by you and, the, and the, the, trick of, the trick of it is to open your heart, your eyes and your mind to seeing seeing what's around you and trying to explore that as well if you're so inclined i happen to be inclined towards the far away wild places but that isn't necessarily the case for everybody that, that's some yeah i mean that's true it's great advice you know i've also noticed that sometimes i'll take a picture of something and i think it's an interesting view and anyone around me might be like well i would have taken a slightly different uh vantage point or whatever and, and then I'll try it from their perspective and it gives me a whole new 
lease on it. Well, the thing is that everything's different. I mean, everybody sees everything different. I mean, even just being taller, shorter, yep. different focal lengths, different angles are going to give you a different result. And there really is no right way to do it or no wrong way to do it. It's just get out there and do it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, I mean, you, you have to raise a good amount of funds to do what you do. Not everybody needs to do that for the local projects, but you know, having the nonprofit and, and getting involved in different organizations. If you're passionate about something, there is an organization out there that somebody can get involved in to then offer their photo photographic services to go do something yeah, similar. Yeah, that, that's a really important thing to remember. There's, there, there's sort of a parallel universe in this, in this society, which is all about the nonprofits. You know, most of the of the of the chatter you hear in the world is driven by the for-profit sector, but there's a big multi-billion dollar, tens of billions of dollars worth of nonprofits out there that are trying to do good, and the good that they offer doesn't generate a profit necessarily. So all of those nonprofits need to um, need to rely, in many cases, on the on the goodwill and good services, the pro bono, the donated services of a lot of people. So I, I tell environmentally oriented photographers a lot that there's a limitless universe of grassroots organizations as well as big national scale organizations that are eager to have the passionate uh, photographic work of, of devoted people. So there's always a cause you can attach yourself to if you're so inclined. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, what? I was just going to, I mean, I, I'd love to sit here and talk to you all day long. I know you are a very busy man. We probably ought to let you get on to other people. Actually, I have to go fundraising right now. <laughs> that, that is also very important. Yeah. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come out and visit with us. Check out the book. Check out the movie. I, mean, I want to see the movie. I want to, I want to watch that. Thank you. Yeah, come Saturday. One thing we didn't talk about, you on social media. Can we find you on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, things like that? Are I am you... told that there are people that are doing that for me. I haven't touched the Twitter key yet, uh, but, oh, but apparently okay. it's out there. It uh, is. I, I'm, I just find myself so overwhelmed with the communication process that if I go down that, it, that rabbit hole, be... I'll never get back out. You know? okay. uh, but yes, all that stuff is out there. Uh, but the big thing is chasing ice. Watch for it in your theaters in the middle of November and go out and buy the book. Ice, Portraits of Vanishing Glaciers, James Balog and the Extreme Ice Survey. Now we, we have a couple more minutes, but uh, where will you be signing? And will you be signing across the country or just... Just here at Photo. If, if Saturday, of course, we'll be here. I will be doing intermittent book signings in different places, depending on what all the various events are. I, I Personally, I don't even keep the calendar on that. There's a producer who tracks all that. So in, in terms of a book, now I've looked in the, you know, producing books... There's a lot that has to go into the right paper, the right people to produce this. Did, were you in, heavily involved in finding the right solution for that? Well, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rizzoli had approached me several years ago wanting, wanting to be the publisher of this book, and uh, they turned out to be a f fabulous publisher. And um, I'm very happy to have them as a partner. They do the best fine art books uh, in the country. And that's a key. That's a key. Yeah. If you don't have quality printing and a quality book, your yeah. photos are going to get lost. I yeah. think Rizzoli's just a few booths over from us, too, oh, are if they? I remember Good. correctly. Good. But. Well, and the other big thing was I wanted to have um, what's called FSC paper, for Forest Stewardship Council paper, and it's a recycled paper. And a lot of publishers are really uh, uh, anxious about printing on that stuff for reasons that don't make any sense. And, and with the print run that we had, which was substantial and respectable, it cost them a premium of $1,500 to get FSC recycled paper instead Across of the normal the You mean the, the, the entire whole run, run was $1,500? Yeah, and most publishers would push back in an instant and say, we can't possibly afford FSC paper, but Rizzoli stepped up to the responsibilities and, and did good. the right thing. That's you know, good. That's what I want in a publisher. That's, that's very awesome. good. That's very good. What what size is the book? Because I know sometimes you get those small photo books. Other times you get these overly large. Well, I love the big books on the coffee table. They're nice if you have a big coffee table. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know what the trim size is. Roughly like uh, 11 by 14 that's approximately. A great, that's like a pretty great good, size. Pretty healthy size. I, I thought of doing a really gigantic one, but, but when you start to look at the ecological footprint of those things, I decided that I couldn't be doing what I was doing and doing that ecological footprint. And, I, and I'm still... You know, sometimes I'm comfortable with the fact that we've got six pounds of paper sitting there in each one of these books. Yeah. Uh, I get nervous about that, but 
it was kind of a balancing act between yeah. what was righteous and what was right yeah. aesthetically. So, so that's what we came out with. Excellent. Well, you, you talked about gear. Just one last question. I saw you had the D200s that you guys retrofitted in a Pelican case. Right. What is your go-to camera? I use, I use a uh, Nikon D3 all the time. Uh, I love that camera. I mean, these things are just They're bomb, built. incredibly strong. And I, I've been using Nikons for since about 1981. I was and, born in 1981, by the really? way. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I've just been amazed at how durable Nikon cameras are. When, when I was working on the tree project in about uh, 11, 12, 13 years ago, I was out in situations where it was cold, it was rainy, there was a lot of dust, a lot of grit got in those cameras, and I knew I had to shoot digitally for the first time, and I had never done any digital photography before, and I was highly skeptical of whether or not electronic driven cameras could function properly in that kind of an environment and I was happily surprised to discover that I had not one single hiccup from the Nikon D1X during that project wow. and then I was on Nikon D2Xs and then on and on and on. I mean the, the stuff really really works. It's amazing. Although in all fairness Canon also builds some good stuff, and it's very reliable, and everything. It doesn't matter what you shoot with. It's what you do with. Yeah, exactly. It's it, yeah. nothing. To, Canon makes great cameras too. There's no question. It just happens to be Nikon is what what I know and what I use. Most of the people we're talking to, that's the case. I shoot Canon, but I'm kind of rare. A lot, a lot of people really love the the Nikon. It's split all across yeah. the board. The, you know, the key thing is what's in your head and what's in your heart. You know, that's what you're really after. And and you know we. We photographers tend to spend too much time thinking about the hardware and not thinking enough about the software that's inside. Yep. Uh, but it all matters. It all counts. It's all important. These are these are really amazing tools that have activated a lot of possibilities in the creative world that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Absolutely. Indeed. Well, thank you cool. so much. Thank you guys. We, a, we appreciate you. you taking care of the stewardship of our environment. And B, I am seriously looking forward to the film. I want to see all that hard work you put into the stop motion photography, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, we'll go check out the book. Sounds good. All right. All have right. a good see show. Thank you very much. Take care. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That